In the morning, I drink coffee. In the evening, I drink wine. In between, I drink water. That's how I made it to the ripe old age of 62 in a few weeks. Mm. Today I am going to remake an interview I granted in February 2019, that's four years ago and a year before the pandemic had erupted. I granted the interview in February 2019 and then uh, I had to remove it from my channel, don't ask, <laughs> and today I'm going to essentially redo my sections of the interview, about 99% of it, so you're not missing, you're not missing out on much. Okay, the interview is about self being seen, being seen, and if you can't be seen by other people, self-seeing, seeing yourself. And how seeing yourself is an integral part of self-parenting. And how self-parenting is both self-soothing and ultimately healing. Apropos healing, my name is Salvaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and I'm a former visiting professor of psychology. Stay with me. I have no idea why. <laughs> Okay, the personality disorders in, the, in cluster B, the whole spectrum, can be seen as an organizing principle because they affect other fields as well. Take narcissism, for example. The development of, in, of narcissism isn't just in the field of psychology, but it, it's actually in other fields of human endeavor. <clears throat> the two core main problems are the disintegration of narratives and the declining ability to tell stories. And the second issue we have identified is community, the demise of communities all over the world. There's a third observation. There's a shift from essence or substance to appearance and spectacle. So these are the three problems I'm going to focus on at the beginning of this, what had become a lecture. The Guy Debord, uh, who was a French philosopher and theoretician of culture in the 1960s, wrote a book called The Society of the Spectacle. It was a very prescient book, very prophetic, eerily accurate. He said that everything will shift from substance to appearance, and everyone will begin to put emphasis on image manipulation, image management, impression management. In other words, on spectacle, everything will become one big theater. That's Guy Debord. He suggested that there's a sort of dictatorial effect of imagery. Images, he said, shut everything down. If you see an image, it trumps, apologies for the word, it trumps everything else. Actually, there was another guy, more or less, during the same period. His name was Louis Althusser. Both of these guys ended up committing suicide, and Althusser spent some time in a mental asylum, similar to Nietzsche. This is why I think that both of them are perfect authorities on our current insane, nightmarish, dystopian day and age. Althusser coined the term interpolation. He said that Social practices such as advertising, media, government propaganda, and so on and so forth are intended to interpolate us, to tell us how to behave, to dictate to us. Guy Debord added the observation that the most effective form of interpolation is via imagery. I'm going somewhere with this. Stay tuned and be patient. So Guy Debord made the leap of reasoning that manipulation, interpolation, and control will be the buzzwords of the future. And of course, in this, he agreed. He was in full agreement with the likes of George Orwell and, and others. He said that in all probability, the image would become the main tool, the main instrument in the hands of the few to control the many, and in the hands of the many to succumb, to accept this control. Because to be controlled, 
In order to be controlled, you have to collaborate. It's a tango. It takes two. The controlled masses collaborate with the controlling elites. And they collaborate for a variety of reasons, which we will go later. We'll go into later. It's part of a much bigger picture. It's a transition from substance and essence to appearances and looks. What interpolation, put simply, is manipulation inducing behavior or inhibiting behavior via a series of targeted structured messages that appear in a specific sequence. If it, is re if it reminds you of, of verbal abuse, it's for good reason. Watch my previous video about entraining. The perfect example, though, is advertising on the social level, advertising and propaganda. Now, coming back to substance and to appearances, I tied it in with my principle of the need to be seen. I think the overriding need that each and every one of us has is to be seen, to be noticed. It is simply the need to stand out somehow. It affirms our existence as a separate individual. It validates our emotions and our aspirations. If you are not seen, you feel annulled. Being ignored means being dead, in effect. Think back to childhood. Think back to childhood and you will realize why being seen is so critical. A baby who is not seen is very, very fast. Very fast becomes a dead baby. The need to be seen is primordial. It underlies existence. It is a foundation. It is a condition for survival. It's a necessary condition. It's not a sufficient condition, but it's a necessary condition. You must be seen. If you're not seen by your mother, you're in trouble when you're six months old. So the need to be seen is an integral part of our psychology from the very, very, very uh, beginning of, from its very inception. What I said was that, or what I'm saying is that as the number of people multiplies, today we are 8.1 billion on this poor <laughs> planet, as the number of people multiplies, it becomes more and more difficult to be noticed. Either you stand out or you're left out. These are the options we all faced, we all faced with today. People find it more and more difficult to be seen. They find it more and more difficult to be seen, not only because of the explosion in population numbers, but because the frameworks which we had laboriously constructed over millennia, the frameworks whose sole or main function was to see us, to notice us, to pay attention to us, these frameworks have utterly disintegrated in a matter of a hundred years. The frameworks of communities, community, family, neighborhood, the village, the tribe, all these frameworks have disintegrated and now you can't be seen. Even your own neighbors don't see you. Maybe your dog or <laughs> I don't know. Not being seen is the current existential condition. Because people cannot be seen, the need to be seen becomes even more overpowering. And it is it requires skills. To be seen became a skill, a skill set. They are experts at how to be seen. People who perfected the art and skill of being seen and nothing else besides. These people are called celebrities. Celebrities are famous for being famous. Their main skill, their main accomplishment in life is that, is that they had made it. They succeeded to be seen. Sometimes, and very often actually, only that. They've done nothing else in their lives. To be seen became a skill and people all over the world are perfecting this skill. Now the transition from substance and essence to appearance and looks hinges on that. Because in order to be seen, you have to project an image. You have to become a spectacle. We all became one person spectacles. We all became our images. In psychology, we have the concept of introject. That is when the voices of people who are significant, our parents, important peers, role models, these voices are internalized. They become an integral part of our psychology, introjects. So today, we don't do introjection anymore. We are all projecting, not introjecting. 
We're all creating elaborate facades, elaborate spectacles and images which we project onto others in, with a, in a desperate hope that they will introject us. So we project and we're trying to force or coerce others to introject. It became a battle of projection and introjection. This is absolutely how it is. And it's not limited to the social sphere. When we say narcissism, we tend to think either of the clinical entity, narcissistic personality disorder, or we tend to think of social phenomena, such as social media, celebrities, show business, reality TV, and so on and so forth. And all of this is true. I'm not disputing any of this. But narcissism is an organizing principle of our entire civilization. It makes its appearance everywhere, not only in psychology, not only in mass media, not only in social media, not only in, the, in spectacles. You can find narcissism everywhere. You can find it in science. You can find it in fashion. You can find it in food, nutrition. It appears everywhere. I'll give you a few examples. Consider fashion. In the first 9,900 years of recorded human history, the role of clothing was to hide the body. You see that in Islam, for example, where clothing serves to hide the body. You see it in Africa. I worked four years in Africa. Everyone there, when they bother to wear clothes, <laughs> the clothes are intended to hide the body, not to display it, not to emphasize it. In the 1950s and 1960s, we have endured a revolution in fashion. We have moved, we have transitioned from concealing fashion, concealing clothing, clothes that conceal, to clothes that reveal and accentuate. If you look at swimming suits, up until the 1950s, these swimming suits were intended to conceal the body. If you look at swimming suits after the eruption of the bikini, they're intended to reveal, to emphasize, to sculpt the body. They are a form of pornography. Clothing had become narcissistic. Consider food. Until the end of the 19th century, well, just to explain, I have many bizarre hobbies. When I'm, when I'm in and out of mental asylum, I'm not, uh, I, I dwell upon various topics. So one of my hobbies is reading ancient medical texts, old medical texts. I've just finished reading one of them, a 1911 medical text. You see, when these medical texts discuss nutrition, when they deal with food, they emphasize the medical properties of food. They discuss the nutritional value of food. There is no hint, not a hint until the 1940s of calories, not a hint of what food does to the shape of your body. Not the beginning of a shadow of a conversation or a discussion of how food relates to your looks and your appearance. So we've made again a transition in the 1940s and 1950s from considering food as medicinal or nutritional to considering food as a way to shape your appearance, your body. Hence, diets. Diets are a modern phenomenon. I don't know if, you're, if, if you realize this, it's a totally modern thing. There's no hint of diets in the 19th century. <laughs> Dieting is about using food to impact, to affect the way you look. Fashion is about revealing your body. Cosmetic procedures, plastic surgeries, the beauty industry, all these are examples, manifestations, reifications of narcissism. The narcissism is not only about Instagram and girls peeling bananas, or showing your butt cheeks. Narcissism affects a diverse, literally the diversity of human civilization. It affects how we see food, it affects how we see clothing and use it. And now I will go even deeper. One of the first manifestations of pathological narcissism was actually in physics. I'm a physicist by training, but I'm, and I'm still an active physicist. I'm working in physics. There was a revolution in physics. Until the 1920s, the aim of physics, the purpose of physics, starting with Aristotle and ending with Albert Einstein, the aim was to describe the essence, the substance of reality. The question that physics used to ask before the 1920s was, what is reality? And then in the 1920s, something amazing happened. 
physics transitioned from substance to appearance. All modern theories in physics, starting with the, fam with famous, with the famous quantum mechanics, all modern theories, don't deal with the essence of reality. If you ask questions about the essence of reality, the quiddity of reality, you're mocked, you're ridiculed, or you lose your job. <laughs> modern theories in physics are not about substance. They don't ask the question what, they ask the question how or how to. Quantum mechanics, for example, is focused on obtaining accurate numerical results in experiments. It's more generally quantum theory says nothing. Quantum theory says nothing or nothing intelligible about the world, about reality, about the universe, or about anything else for that matter. Quantum theory prides itself on the fact that it corresponds 100% with experimental results with appearances as captured in experiments. And then there's a group of scientists, the world's leading physicists, and they kept meeting in a series of conferences, initially called the Solvay conferences. And in these conferences, these scientists tried to explicate, they tried to explain the shocking transition in the 1920s from trying to study nature, trying to comprehend reality, to the study of experiments and devices. Experiments are images. Experiments are spectacles. They're not reality. So there were these Solvay conferences and they came up with the following conclusions. One, the role of physics is not to capture the essence or substance of reality. It is to describe reality sufficiently in order to produce accurate experimental data. So there was a formal shift to appearances, to spectacle and to images as captured in the lab. Second, they reach a conclusion and it is called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. They reach a conclusion that it is the observer who is creating the world by making experimental decisions. According to the Copenhagen interpretation, which is one of the most dominant interpretations, the world is created by multiple observers. I ask you, can there be anything more narcissistic than this? And I'll give you a clue as to the correct answer, the answer that would please me. No. This, this was a manifestation of narcissism in physics. So Albert Einstein couldn't accept it. For 40 years he fought with these people. He kept telling them God doesn't play dice. It cannot be that the mind determines the world. There's an objective reality outside the mind. And everyone was mocking him. The 40 years until he died, he became a clown. In the last 40 years of Einstein's life, he was the clown of physics, the jester, not the godfather of physics. Why? Because Einstein refused adamantly to make this transition from substance and reality to spectacle and image. He refused completely to accept that we are the center of the world. We create the world. We are God. <laughs> it was back to religion. Initially, religion insisted that man is the center of creation and everything revolves around man. I mean, this is the epitome of narcissism to say that the observer in an experiment determines the outcome of the experiment by his act of, of observation. It means you're God, you're the creator. I just gave you a few examples. Fashion industry, food, medicines, physics. Medicine, physics. What, what I'm trying to tell you is that narcissism is all pervasive ubiquitous. It is not limited to Instagram. It's the way we structure our civilizations, the way we interact with reality and interpret it. That, that's why narcissism is such a big deal. It's a huge deal because it's not only about a-holes and jerks. It's about how we organize the very life in our very culture, in our very society. So quantum, quantum uh, physics is a narcissistic strain of physics. The common interpretation, as I said, is Copenhagen interpretation. And so, I don't believe in God, as you all know. It's not the issue, I'm not a religious person. But what I'm saying is that physics has actually transformed into metaphysics and even religion. It's an observer-centered religion. And the observer, is a creator or God. And it's, a, it's an example of a distributed religion. Narcissism is a distributed religion. 
where every node in the network is both a god and a worshipper. According to quantum mechanics, each and every one of us, each and every single one of us, is generating the, the whole universe every split second. Some interpretations of quantum mechanics insist that we have the capacity to create universes by splitting them with our decisions. Each and every one of us is Shiva. Each and every one of us is Yahweh. It is the first example of a distributed religion, pathological narcissism. And later on, when we invented social media, we created the next stage of distributed religion. I claim that narcissism is going to become the new faith, the new global religion, and this would be the first case in human history where there is going to be no centralized god, god or gods, no pantheon, no, no uh, monotheism, or not even polytheism, but every worshipper, every member of this church will also be a divinity. So we have the distributed religion, where all the members of the nodes in the network are gods. But actually, if you are a physicist, you will have known that this is, has already happened. That there is a precedent in physics. No one connects quantum physics to the rising tide of narcissism, which started after the First World War. And it's not an accident, and it's not a coincidence that quantum physics did not arise until then. All the elements of quantum physics existed in 1895, for example, including the quantum, including the word quantum, all the elements. Why were they not put together until after the First World War? Because that's when narcissism became dominant. Freud coined the, the, the word, I mean, Freud used the word narcissism to describe a pathology in 1915 in his famous essay on narcissism. And because the seismic shift, the earthquake, the tsunami, started in, in the First World War, this made the wave or the tide of narcissism ineluctable and irresistible. I don't know, something broke. It seems that on a societal level, we are having a post-traumatic reaction to the two world wars, to the Spanish flu, to other pandemics, other disasters. It created a kind of lack of faith. I mean, I'm really pontificating here, but maybe world war, the first world war, made people feel on a certain level, maybe there's no God. Maybe we're not being watched because God wouldn't have let this happen. God wouldn't have let these things unfold. The rape, the pillage, the torture, the death. And 20 years later, the Holocaust. People lost faith in a centralized God within an institutional religion. Because they've been too traumatized. All monotheistic and polytheistic religions are observer-based. In other words, you are being observed, monitored, supervised. And if you're primitive, you think that God manages your life on a daily basis, micromanages it. <laughs> Talk to the evangelicals or the Presbyterians in the United States or the Baptists. They are, you know, not the epitome of intellect. So according to them, God interferes on a daily basis in their lives, determines everything they're doing, and they consult with God. They consult with God, they talk to God, God talks back to them. He has nothing better to do but to talk back to them. I don't know how he has the time to do all this. Probably modern time management software. I should have a chat with him on how he manages his time. But even if you are that primitive, even if you are... Uh, even then, you're still the center. It's a bit like paranoia, you know, you're the center. God revolves around you. God talks to you, responds to your queries and prayers. When you go to the other extreme, top-level intellectuals who are also religious, they also believe there's some kind of supervision going on, even if this supervision and observance is via the laws of nature. That there is a possibility of the all-pervasiveness of God and ubiquity of God in nature. But all these are the exact opposite of quantum mechanics. All religions, all classical religions, non-classical religions, deism, theism, I mean, all these, they're all determined by a god, which is somehow perceived to be external. Even if 
Even if claimed otherwise, it's still perceived to be outside you, not you. But in quantum mechanics, you're not determined by God's observation of you. In quantum mechanics, you are the one who is det determining the world. Potentially, you are the one who is det determining God himself. I think people give up. I think what happened in the First World War, it lasted four years, 20, 30, 20 to 30 million people were killed. There was nothing like that before. After that, there was a flu epidemic, which killed another 100 million. And immediately after that, there was a series of regimes like Nazism, Fascism, Communism, Maoism, which killed yet another 100 million people. It was too much. It was too much. People were being objectified. They were being traumatized by everything. Natural phenomena, I don't know, man-made disasters, regimes, wars, warfare. I mean, they felt like objects. Ideologies also regarded them as raw material. So there were about 40 years in the last century in which people were constantly being objectified. And to be objectified means you're not seen. There was a major, major vacancy in being seen. Four decades of being not being seen. So you're objectified, you're not being seen, and this is the biggest lesson of narcissistic abuse. The problem in narcissistic abuse is that you're being objectified by the narcissist. People all over the world were being objectified. And so they lost faith. They said to themselves, well, I can't be seen anymore, not even by God himself. Institutions are disintegrated. Role models have betrayed me. The elites are stabbing me in the back. The world is a dangerous, hostile place. There are no communities. Families are falling apart. I cannot tell myself stories anymore. I cannot come up with convincing narratives because all of them have become horror, surrealistic, dystopian stories. So what to do? What to do? This is the observation of Bruno Bettelheim in his famous book on fairy tales and enchantment. This, I cannot be seen. If I cannot be seen by others, I have to become self-sufficient. If I cannot be seen from the outside, I have to observe myself. I have to see myself. I have to become recursive, reflexive. And every person in this postmodern world is self-referential. There are no others anymore. There's just you. There's you and you, and you are observing you, and you are seeing you, and you are validating you, and you are supplying you. And so everyone was saying, I cannot be seen anymore by my community, by my family. There's no community, there's no family. By my village, there's no village, no authorities. No, I mean, nothing. I cannot be seen even by my friends. The number of close friends has declined by 90% in the past 40 years. There's, no one, there's nobody there. No one is left. We are all alone in the most profoundly existential way we are the first time we are solipsistic cannot be seen anymore so if i can't be seen anymore i need to see myself and this became a reflexive solipsistic kind of thing you have to become become your own source of being seen it's a great definition of narcissism self-seeing i think that the issue of recursivity, where if you cannot get seen by other people, you can only hold up a mirror to yourself. This is as good a mirror as any. You know, you just stare into this mirror and you see yourself. So when people are looking into their smartphones, they're actually really looking into their mirrors. They are seeing themselves again and again and again to feed that first, that survival instinct to be seen, to be observed. And of course, being seen is addictive. It's an auto-erotic act. It's not, only, uh, it's not only my observation. People like Freud said it. Auto-erotism is addictive. And give example, Freud gave an example of babies. For, babies are auto-erotic and you can see babies eating their own toes or eating other things, which I'm not going to. 
because they are consuming themselves. They're literally digesting themselves and consuming everything that comes out of them. Autoerotism is about the self, is about consuming yourself. That's why when you are in a relationship with a narcissist, you feel consumed because the narcissist's way of seeing is recursive, is reflexive. And because you are an extension of the narcissist, you are being consumed by him, together with his own self-consumption. The narcissist devours himself, and because you are perceived to be a part of himself, he devours you too. And nothing but an internal object, remember. This is, the narcissist's way is a consuming way, an autoerotic way of seeing himself. It's addictive, it's conditioning, but it's essentially devouring. We have made this transition into narcissism because of the disintegration of communities, institutions, social units, social safety nets, the very social fabric. Role models, gatekeepers, they've all disappeared on us. They're all gone. Narratives unraveled, nothing is left. So we have transitioned from mere loneliness to self-company. Loneliness has always been a state in which people found themselves. But it, it used to be loneliness in the sense that you were lonely. It was a situation you could easily ameliorate or mitigate with a series of choices. For example, you could socialize, you could date, you could go and study something, you know, whatever. Loneliness was in the past. Loneliness was a choice. Today we have existential loneliness. It's a fact that because everyone is navel-gazing and because everyone is so occupied with seeing themselves, with self-seeing, they don't have the resources, the time, the energy to see you. So the only way you can see yourself is as an object. And the only way they can see you is as an object. In other words, today... You have two choices, to not be seen or to be objectified by someone, external or by yourself. And the truth is that to be objectified is a way of being seen. You are seen as an object, but you're still being seen somehow. It's better than nothing. I mean, you're something. Um, so being a thing today is preferable to being ignored. You're either a thing in itself, or to use Kant's, to use Kant's words, or you're just a thing, a consumable, a commodity. The majority of people compromise and they say, okay, I prefer to be a thing to be objectified than to not be seen. And there is no third option. This is the huge revolution in human affairs. There's no third option today. If you refuse to be objectified, you cannot be seen. You can be seen only by yourself. And even then, typically, you're objectified, self-objectified. So today, the only options are narcissism or to be objectified by others. Being objectified doesn't necessarily mean that you're a victim. You can be objectified and rather enjoy it. <laughs> but these are the two emotional options you have. Narcissism or being objectified? Not that option today. We have. So, what can we do? What can we do about this sad, horrible world? We have to restore seeing. We have to restore seeing. We need to get rid of distractions. We need to re establish a sense of community. And above all, we need to regain our ability to tell stories. Obviously, I can't really see you. No one can really see anyone else because of the very simple fact that no one has access to anyone else's mind. I don't even know if you have a mind. No offense there. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I don't even know if anyone else has a mind and no one else knows if I have a mind. I'm out of my mind. <laughs> so this is simply an assumption. Mind is an assumption. It's a working hypothesis. We call it the intersubjective agreement in philosophy. We make an assumption based on empathy that everyone is like us. And so because we have a mind, they have a mind. We feel pain, they feel pain, love, love, whatever. We can't really see anyone else. So what do we see? We see the narrative. We see stories. We see someone else's self-reporting. 
We've organized our entire social, emotional, and cultural lives around storytelling. And it is this capacity to tell stories that we have lost. And now, ironically, as the more numerous stories we tell on screen, movies, television, smartphones, you name it, the more stories we tell, the less capable we are of telling each other stories. Because you see, intermediated stories, stories which are transmitted via technology, are not the same. We transition from direct storytelling to intermediate storytelling, and it lost the, the enchantment, it lost the power. Today we tell stories to each other via screens, essentially. 99.99% .99 of all stories are communicated via screens. On social media platforms, they are called actually stories. Not in vain. A storytelling became indirect. So what's the problem here? There are two problems with this. First of all, our previous attempts at storytelling, the attempts that kept us alive, that kept us seen, that kept us relatively functional, that kept us moderately or modestly happy, that kept us in communities, that built up cultures and religions and civilizations, all these previous attempts at storytelling were mediated via gatekeepers. There were gatekeepers. There were people who decided how stories should be told, what is the allowed content of stories, and what is disallowed or useless. And all these gatekeepers have been removed today. We don't have gatekeepers anymore. For example, we don't have editors. So today what's happening is that we have no orientation. We are totally disoriented. Even the stories that we are being fed via our screens are essentially disintermediated. They are not curated. There are no gatekeepers, no people who help us make decisions about quality, about background, about context, about structure, about the future, nothing. No guidance. We are utterly left adrift to our own devices. We are very much alone in facing this torrent of storytelling, all of which is coming from strangers. So we don't have the basic information to decide. The vast majority of storytelling in the past came from acquaintances, at the very least, usually from friends, intimate partners, spouses, family, extended family, grandmothers, grandfathers. Nine out of 10 stories came from people you could trust, or at least people that you knew, who knew who you knew. Today, 99 out of 100 stories come from people you have no idea about, you know nothing about. So there's a breakdown of trust. There are no gatekeepers to tell you anything, so it's very disorienting. The second problem is called discoverability. There's an avalanche of stories, and because there are no gatekeepers, there's no one to tell you which ones to pay attention to. These are the stories you would rather listen to, but you're not aware of it. They are more, some stories are more qualitative than others. Some stories are more useful than others. Some stories are more truthful than others. But <laughs> how can you discover these stories in a, in a dung heap, in a, in a garbage dump? How can you discover these particular gems, hidden, buried? And the result is fake news. And the result is misinformation. And the result is conspiracy theories. There are no guidelines. There's no inter intermediation, there are no gatekeepers. What we have is intermediated storytelling only in the technological sense, in the sense that the stories go through some filter on a screen. But there's disintermediation of quality control. So the result is we are utterly buried in an avalanche, in a tsunami of content, and we are left with no tools to make any judgments about this content. It's extremely, extremely um, disoriented. It leads to something which I called 20 years ago, disintermediated atomization. We are so inundated, so flooded, so overwhelmed that we simply avoid, we withdraw. We withdraw. We create silos, we create echo chambers, we create bubbles with confirmation bias. I want to know only this information, we say. I, if I come across information that contradicts my, my type of information, I'm gonna ignore it, I'm gonna become aggressive, so you can see that these are all storytelling related pathologies. It's a huge mess because in the past, if you didn't have good stories, you had good communities. If you didn't have good communities, you had good families. If you didn't have families, you had authorities. If you, if you trusted the authorities, you had an ethos, like the American dream. If you didn't have an ethos, 
you had role models. And if you didn't have those, you had curated content, content you could trust. For example, the Encyclopedia Britannica. There's all, there was always a way out, an exit strategy, a lever. There's always a pivot. There's always a point upon which you could, like Archimedes, leverage the world. A point upon which you could balance your world. Today, there's nothing. Nothing except essential and existential loneliness. So the cure would be, should be, we need to consciously do something. It, it might prove to be awkward and uncomfortable, but we need to bring back an ethos, a unifying narrative. We need to bring back role models. We need to bring back some kind of an overriding story that makes sense. Even if we are consuming it non-religiously, even if we are taking it on board because we know that it's something that we need psychologically, consider it as a form of medication. Maybe this would be the road out of the chaos. Sit together around a proverbial, proverbial campfire and tell stories. There's no question that if you isolate small groups, you can restore a modicum of other seeing, seeing the other in the classical philosophical sense. The smaller the group, the more the act of seeing others. The concept of the other, the concept, this concept is very crucial in most Western philosophy and not only in Western philosophy. The other, the gaze of the other, the interaction with the other, it connects your own identity with someone else's and contributes to your well-being, helps you gain orientation and familiarity in the world. The other is crucial. It's not a threat. So if you take 10 teenagers, you can probably reconstruct or help them to reconstruct the capacity of seeing others rather than self-seeing. Probably you can help them regain a modicum of storytelling capabilities and even get them interested in storytelling. Maybe even make them addicted to storytelling, which is a good thing. The only good addiction. Possibly you can construct this way some form of proto-community. But in, I'm afraid if, if you're talking about society-wide trends, we, we may be a bit too late. We may even be way too late because all the institutions that could have helped us implement society-wide changes have been decimated, absolutely decimated, starting with the family, of course. Storytelling today is ridiculed and mocked and frowned upon as some form of naivety or stupidity or gullibility. You don't have to believe me. Go to the talk pages of Wikipedia, where experts are chased out of town, authority figures are trampled on, professors are mocked and ridiculed and distrusted because they are at the service of mammon, or money, or the New World Order, or the Illuminati, or some other insane conspiracy theory, with or without reptilians. I think we've opened the floodgates, and the sewer and the barbarians are at the gates. They're not only at the gates, actually, they're inside the city. I mean, the elites, the intellectual elites, the financial elites, political elites, we have betrayed the masses. So not, not in the sense that the masses think uh, that they have been betrayed, but we have, we have really done it. This is not a conspiracy theory. When the masses try to explain to themselves the unease and discomfort and feeling of betrayal that they have, they resort to conspiracy theories, but we don't have to. All we have to do is observe recent history. So if you pick, pick up a, any 10 people from the, from the street and you ask them, why do you feel bad in this world? Why do you feel, why this enormous discomfiture? Why do you feel that you don't belong here? Why do you feel that you don't own your life? That you don't control your existence? Why do you have an external locus of control? These 10 people will tell you, well, because the world is ruled by a cabal of financiers or politicians or scientists, you take your pick or politicians or, or whatever. These are conspiracy theories. These are the masses attempting to explain to themselves who stabbed them in the back and why. But the truth is, the truth is that the elites did stab the masses in the back. They did betray the masses. I agree with this. I agree fully with this contention but not in the way the masses think, not via conspiracy. The elites betrayed the masses by abrogating their functions as their function as gatekeepers. They gave up this function because they realized that in a world without gatekeepers, they can make a hell of a lot more money 
and have a, have a hell of a lot more popularity and influence. They prostituted themselves. They gained power. They corrupted the world. That's what the elite did. The elites did. They created this horrible, disintermediate, solipsistic world because it benefited them. This was not a conspiracy. There's no Bilderberg group that sat around and said, well, let's now construct this and that. It just happened. The elites discovered, piece by piece, in an uncoordinated manner, in different parts of the world, different periods of history, recent history, they simply discovered that the more things fall apart, the more they stand to gain, to make fortunes, to become powerful, influential, well-known. So the elites betrayed the masses with alacrity by granting the masses access to dangerous instruments. It's exactly like letting a child play with fire and then pretending to be a good parent, taking him to the hospital. The elites all around the world, starting with the intellectual elites, the elites prostituted themselves and their knowledge by dumbing it down and by uh, intentionally hiding some things. The financial elite, of course, the political elite. Look, it's wrong to say there are no elites. It's equally wrong to say that these people don't communicate with each other from time to time. It's just that they don't have standing structures which implement well-designed multi-millennia conspiracy, conspiracies. <clears throat> That's what I'm saying. But their interests do coincide. The technologies they use are the same. Their aims are identical, and they do include money and power. So these elites cohere, they become coherent. But they're not coherent because of some planning, central planning. They're coherent because of the structure of society and the incentives that this structure provides. It's like evolution. There's no designer. There's no God who said, okay, now the sponge will become Donald Trump. No. But evolution has inbuilt principles of action. And these principles of action drove the sponge to become you know who. So it's the same with these elites. There are inbuilt principles of action, a series of shared values, observations, imitation, mimicry that ultimately cohere the elites, render them one, make them look like one body. Appearances are deceiving in this case. What the elites have done, and what I'm saying, is um, that it's less about revolution and more about evolution. The main role, obligation, and moral duty of the elites has been to prevent the masses from gaining access to some technologies. Prevent them. Some decision-making processes should have never been relegated to the masses. I think the elites abrogated their duty, broke their oath, and neglected their obligations by granting the masses unfettered, dysregulated, and uneducated access to technologies, to power, even to money. I think this was a mistake. I don't know, the mortgage crisis. <laughs> that this granting the masses access to money. There's a kind of passive-aggressive abuse abusiveness in just saying, okay, children, you can do everything, anything you want. The, the elites know very well that they are giving people enough rope to hang themselves with. But they want to hold themselves and say, look, look, you know, it's, it's not us. It's the masses. Look what you did when it, we did give you access to money. You bought five houses when you, when you were a stripper and $2,000 a week. So, of course, there's a crisis, but this crisis is engineered by default. It's a form of abuse. Uh, when you know that your actions will result in chaos and still you, you act, that's abuse. To allow your child to play with electricity is not progressive liberalism. It's abuse. And in most civilized countries, you go to prison for this. Social media gave unmitigated access to power to the masses. The internet provided access to power to the masses. Mortgages provided access to money to the masses. Democracy, as it is practiced in the West, 
is access to political power granted to the masses, however, in however limited a way. None of these manifestations should have happened. Take democracy, for example. One vote, one man. How on earth could you justify this? Morally, philosophically, ethically, historically, and operationally. Common sense, proper reason. I mean, why would every person have a vote exactly like every other person? Isn't this idiotic? For example, don't you think that voters should be educated before they vote? Don't you think they should have a skin in the game? Should have skin in the game? Don't you think they should have something to lose? Don't you think they should pass an exam on the issues that they're voting on, for example, in referenda? Don't you think they should, to some extent, own property, sire children? If you give one vote to one man, don't you think people with property and children should have more votes? Like, I have one vote because I don't have children. You should have three votes because you have three children. You have a lot more to lose. But on the other hand, I have a PhD, so I get three votes. You graduated kindergarten, you get one vote. Isn't that fair? So, as it is designed today, the elites kind of gave up on their educational mission, gatekeeping ethical mission. They just said, let's unleash the masses. Let's have ochlocracy, mob rule, because there's a lot of money in this. We convert all these idiots all these morons into consumers and we sail away in our yachts to our private jet. You need a license to do anything, to depilate women's legs, I don't know, you need a license. Uh, to drive a motorcycle, you need a license. But there are three things in life for which you do not need a license. And they're by far the most important thing, things. I mean, you don't need, need a license to become a parent, to have children. You don't need a license to vote, and you don't need to have a license to access the most powerful technology humanity has ever come up with. This is far more dangerous and potentially destructive than any nuclear weapon. This technology is called the Internet. And for these three things, you don't need a license. So the horses are out of the stable a long time ago. Now, to take away what has been given, it's going to be tough. It's going to be traumatic. It's going to be painful. There'll be pushback. There'll be resistance. So it's going to be not going to be easy. If we try to restore a modicum of self-control, control, discipline, quality standards, common sense, storytelling, community orientation, that's not going to be easy. People are now on the path of least resistance. They are alone with themselves and their pets and Netflix. That's people are lazy by nature. They prefer it this way. Coming back to self-seeing. Self-seeing is far more addictive than other things. It has a potential to heal because it's an integral part of self-parenting. In self-seeing, though, there are serious pitfalls and traps because you do it by yourself. There's no corrective feedback. And there's confirmation bias. Let me explain what I'm saying. We started the conversation with self-seeing and other things because others can't see you or don't see you anymore. So you need to, you need to do it by your, on your own. You need to self-supply. You can't outsource. You can't be seen by others. So you see yourself. You have to resort to seeing yourself because someone has to see you and there's nobody else around. If God doesn't see you, if the community doesn't see you, if other people don't see you, if your family disintegrated and can't see you, if the village is gone, you're forced to see yourself as a last resort. But here's the thing. When you see yourself, the longer you see yourself, the more addictive it becomes. It's addictive because you encounter no resistance, no dissonance, no arguing back, no criticism. As I said, no corrective feedback or input. When you see other people, it does open up the possibility for constructive dissonance. They may disagree with you. They may behave in ways which contradict the image that you have constructed for them or in of them. They may defy your expectations. They are autonomous, agentic, independent. They're sometimes abrasive or even offensive. 
to see others and to be seen by others is to take risks, is to be vulnerable, is to have weaknesses or to endure them. To see others is to be refuted and, and narcissistically injured. So it's a risk and we have all become risk averse and we, we all feign invul invulnerability. There's invulnerability signaling going on. To see others is what we call intimacy. To see yourself doesn't have any of these drawbacks, but none of its, none of its benefits. You will never disagree with yourself. You will never criticize yourself, really. Even if you have a strong inner critic, you know the difference. It's a conformist inner critic. It's an inner critic that is predictable. And in most people, controllable. You develop techniques to counter your conscience, conscience and inner critic. So it's a one-man silo. It's a one-man confirmation bias by bubble. It's a straitjacket. It's a padded cell, and it's much easier. And that's why it's addictive, because it is a form of self-soothing, self-comforting, and of course, self-deception. Self-parenting is not about being in full accord with yourself. It's not about idealizing yourself, aggrandizing yourself. That's not self-parenting. That is sick. Self-parenting is about being a parent to yourself. And a good parent places boundaries, enforces discipline, yes, punishes from time to time, educates. Seeing yourself, I said, is a form of self-soothing. Other forms of self-soothing are, for example, binge eating, smoking. None of them, none of them is good. <laughs> it's the exact same psychological functions of substance abuse. It is self-soothing, but also self-destructive and self-defeating. Sucking your thumb. <laughs> when you suck someone else's thumb, that's a real taste. Don't try it at home. What I mean is, seeing other people and being seen by other people is not addictive. It's, it's, it can become a conditioned response, but it's not addictive. Seeing yourself is. So how do you... How do you revert from self-seeing to seeing other people? How do you tell other people that access to so much technological power, so much political power and so much money is bad for them, not good for them because it's, it isolates them. It makes them feel self-sufficient and self-contained and not in need of other people. How do you take that back once you've given it? What, what do you do? Take over the government at the point of a gun and say, comrades, they must be paying for the next five, four or five years. They must be suffering. But, uh, but you will learn this suffering is good for you. I will teach you. I will be a benevolent dictator. What, what do you say? How do you convince people? Consider Amazon, for example. Amazon has a service called KDP. KDP is a Kindle affiliated service where everyone can publish a book. 3.2 million books have been published last year on this platform. 3.2 million have been published since the dawn of the Gutenberg Press. Since the dawn, until the year 1900. So, what's going on here? Last year alone on Amazon, we have doubled the number of books published. How do you take that back? Of course, the overwhelming vast majority of this was unadulterated total trash published by absolute creepy wannabes. But how do you take it back? How do you undo this enormous damage to publishing? Consequently, well over 8 out of 10 publishing houses went bust. The overwhelming majority of bookstores in the United States disappeared. Barnes & Noble went down from 2,600 2, outlets to 500. No one can compete with this avalanche of sewage, of effluence that now pass for books. How do you take this back? If I publish a book about narcissism and another 2,000 people publish a book about narcissism, who is there to tell people that my book is better or maybe worse than other books? And that's a problem of discoverability that I mentioned before. Can you trust reviewers? Of course you can't. These are the same people who need guidance to start with. They also have a problem of discoverability. And this is what we, this, this is the problem that we're faced with. 
the sewage has burst. We're drowning. We don't see anything that can reverse this except something apocalyptic. I don't see anything that can reverse this as well. And so I think apocalypse, uh, I think, is this is why people are so enamored in, for example, in movies with with dystopian scenarios and apocalypse. It's like a big reset, in a way. Um, even then, even then, if we were to restart the world with the with the technologies we have today, it would be a problem to transition from self-seeing to other seeing. It would be a big problem. In the next 10 years, maybe we would actually see a total takeover, the sort of imposition of what would be called Luddite values, where they deliberately descale descale technology. I don't know. There are hints that this may be happening. But it's not only the technology. We gave up on common sense, on critical thinking. All the dictators of the world are actually elected, were elected, in fair and free elections. Democracy leads to Adolf Hitler, or a much better scenario, to Donald Trump. Democracy can't be trusted as a decision-making procedure because the voters have changed. We refuse to acknowledge this. Hitler was elected three times, and we refuse to acknowledge this. Social media leads to teen suicide, another example. 100,000 teens committed suicide in the past five years alone. And the suicides were directly attributable to the usage of social media, correlated with the use of social media. Read the studies by Twenge and Campbell and others. So the conclusion, limit the use of social media. Nope, can't be done. It's not done because, because we gave up on the basic tools of human critical thinking. We gave up, for example, on authority, we gave up on objectivity, we gave up on truth, on the concept of truth. There's no truth anymore. There's your truth, my truth. Alternative facts, as a spokesman of Donald Trump once called it. Alterna so we gave up on, on, on very basic tools. And why did we give up on these basic tools? What's happening? Here's what's happening. The masses don't know how to use these tools. So they insist on eradicating, demolishing, devastating, and eliminating anything they don't know to use. And that's a story. We are losing the treasures of thousands of years of human civilization because we've opened the floodgates to people, to billions. We have no way of appreciating this. No way of appreciating these tools. Because they can't appreciate these tools, this causes an autistic injury, and they destroy the tools. When the barbarians invaded Rome in 476, the first thing they did was destroy all the big structures. Why? Why did they destroy the big structures? Because they didn't know how to build structures. It was an act of protest and rebellion against their own inferiority, removing the reminders of their own inferiority. So now when the masses publish books, they rebel against the correct usage of the English language. I'm kidding you not. I'm inundated with offensive messages. Why do I use highbrow language? Why don't I dumb down? The masses hate the fact that I know English better than they do. They detest me for forcing them to acknowledge their inferiority by causing them to revert to a dictionary. They want to pull me down to their level, not go up to mine. This is destructive envy, not constructive jealousy. And of course, intimacy is an integral uh, part of this, a condition for adulthood. Actually, in object relations theory, which used to be the dominant theory in psychology until the late 60s, the child transitions from self-preoccupation to preoccupation with others. And that and the child redirects his life force, his libido, from himself, which is narcissism, to others. And this is why it's called object relations. As in this school, people were called objects. So we go through a phase of narcissism as children, and then growing up means exposing yourself. Growing up is not a process of becoming stronger, it's a process of becoming weaker. It's not a process of becoming more impregnable and invulnerable, it's a process of becoming more vulnerable. It's not a process of becoming more self-sufficient. It's a process of becoming more dependent. It's a process of developing intimacy. Intimacy is nudity. Int intimacy is being totally at the mercy of someone else. And of course you have to choose the right partner for intimacy. A partner who will not abuse this condition of yours. 
But this is adulthood. This interplay is adulthood. And to insist on your impregnability and vulnerability and so on is what children do. And it's called primary narcissism. So to insist that you are impregnable, invincible, invulnerable, this is to be a child. Because to be an adult is the exact opposite. Primary narcissism is about the grandiosity of taking on the world as this kind of hero. When we are adults, we realize how much of a zero we are. People are brittle. They're fragile. This is why people insist on nanny states. That's why people are so risk averse. There's never been a period in human history of people who are so obsessed with risks, medical risks, transportation risks, political risks. I mean, you name it. <laughs> the core preoccupation of the last 50 years is risk aversion, risk mitigation. Everything revolves around this. People are so, so terrified of assuming risk risks it's as if their immune systems have died it's because you see we develop immune systems only via conflict only through friction only by confronting reality and by getting defeated and by enduring losses you cannot have conflict if you don't have other people around you so the problem of not seeing others is conflict aversion, conflict avoidance, and the impairment of reality testing. The fewer conflicts we have, the less attuned we are to what reality is. Conflict is mediated and generated and engendered by our interactions with other people. So the more isolated we are, the more schizoid, hermetically sealed we are, well, the more brittle we are the more fragile we are. I didn't say that there's no solution. I said that the solution has to be grassroots. It has to be limited to small groups at a time. It has to be a network approach. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to be easy. I, I disagree that any change or solution can be dictated from above. Because the elites have been discredited. No one no one can lead nowadays. No one trusts anyone anymore. What if I said, you know, comrades, do this or whatever. So no one will listen. And if you threaten people, you know, Stalin said that there are only two motivations, love and fear. If you threaten people, this, this, they're going to comply maybe, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be imitative behavior. It's imitation without the corresponding emotional correlates. And that's exactly what communism did, you know. Comrades, split the food equally or we will shoot you. So they split the food equally and then they were shot anyhow. <laughs> we want change that comes from the inside because that's what Freud called insight. It is a change that has an emotional correlate and therefore creates some kind of dynamic, generates cognitive correlates. All this can be accomplished only by rubbing against other people, only by being seen. Being seen is, is again crucial, even in social settings. You need to see people in order to restore their ability to tell stories without being penalized, with impunity. And then somehow you need to create a community. So communities are aggregates or agglomerates of mutual beholding, mutual vision. The, these are the two foundations of community, a common story, a common narrative, and being seen by each other. That's what we call community. So this you can do with 10 people at a time. Um, I didn't say you can do it only with 10 people. I said you can do it at 10, with 10 people at a time. The structure has to be a bit like a communist or a terrorist organization underground cells. <laughs> so you need to be, in a way, subversive. You need to be a, a kind of intellectual terrorist if you're trying to accomplish this, because this would undermine the existing order. The existing order is chaotic, is dissatisfactory, 
It causes all of us unhappiness, and it's time to get rid of it. And of course, all this is threatening to the elites. You will be considered subversive, and you're very likely to be penalized. I mean, look at the weather underground. If you have an ideology, uh, you, you are already dangerous. You can agree, you can disagree, but you are immediately subversive. You're immediately dangerous because you're offering an alternative model which threatens all the vested interests and accumulated wealth of the elites. And of course, they are, they're not going to just sit there and take it. You're going to get in trouble for trying to change the world for the better. They will try to mar marginalize you, demonize you, pathologize you. They will fight back. There's no question. But if you create a super transigent, super flexible structure, which is cellular with partitions, dissociative partitions, so that not everyone knows everything, a, a structure that is self-sufficient and each cell has its own outcomes, and its own repository of, of information, which it doesn't share with others, there's very, very little they can do. There's very little they can do to you. Elites have been known to fall. So, it's a war. It's simply a war. And the only way to fight this war is in a distributed manner, similar to cryptocurrencies, if you wish, or in a distributed manner. We need a distributed ledger, a blockchain kind of rebellion. A blockchain rebellion with no, uh, with no centralized structure, with no headquarters, with no hierarchies, with no personal assistance. Uh, a global movement that is nowhere to be found. Everyone feels, everyone knows that we are in serious troubles trouble and and the prescriptions are different in in each and every case you talk to the right wing right wing ultra alt right you talk to MGTOW, you talk to you talk to red pillars you talk to jews you talk to muslims you're likely to receive different answers but they are all united they all agree on one thing we're in trouble things are bad the world sucks that's the only point of agreement between all ideologies all religions all orientations political otherwise all levels of education, all, all strata of income, all nationalities. Everyone agrees on this single thing. And so I think we, we are dry enough to be sparked. We, we can spark something, can start something. We can organize ourselves in a kind of Boy Scout uh, thing. You can spark a grassroots movement, which will try to alter and change things from the ground up. I don't think it should be hierarchical, as I said. I think it should be network-like or cellular. I think it should focus less on institutional changes, like passing laws or planning or banning some activities or whatever, and more on individuals. Less on existing technologies and more on being seen and on storytelling. If you see another person and if you tell that other person a story, intimacy is created, whether you plan for it or not. And then multiple intimacies, and that's what we call community. We need to recreate village, the village. We need to recreate the commons. That's gone missing. And the elites are taking advantage of these voids, of these lacunas, you know. Within elites, within elites, um, there are conspiracies. Among elites, not so. And even within elites, the conspiracies involve very few people at any given time. So bankers can meet for a lucrative dinner and agree to coordinate interest rates. This, is, this has been the case with LIBOR, the interest rate in, in Britain. Technology giants, titans, can meet in some golf club and agree to share the market. That's been the case with Microsoft. But, and before that, we saw trusts and cartels. It, it could, um, within elites, these things happen. They're shifting alliances, shifting, shifting neural pathways, shifting coalitions of people. Oh, they always come up with conspiracies of some kind or another. Absolutely. Conspiracy is the modus operandi of the elites. But there is no overarching conspiracy in any single elite, and most definitely not between elites, and we can take advantage of this daylight between elites. As an army of the masses, we can take advantage of these disparities between elites. In other words, 
There can be a corrupt politician who receives money from two corrupt bankers who receive their money from three corrupt billionaires. This is by definition a conspiracy. And this corrupt politician may become, I don't know, the president of some country. That makes an even bigger conspiracy. But to say that all financiers of the world, all the bankers of the world, meet in some secret place, and to call this utter unmitigated nonsense reality, you know, that's, that's not true. Why do we deceive ourselves into believing this nonsense? It is holding us back. Conspiracies are too big for the individual. They're too ominous. They're too threatening. They're paralyzing. And they're not real. <laughs> it's like a child's monster under the bed or in, in a closet. If, I mean, members of the elite have the same interests. All of them have the same, share the same values usually. All of them are ruthless, sometimes reckless. And they create what, what is called convergence. They create coherence. It looks as if they are coordinating things, but they're not. If I tell you, listen, your aim is A and my aim is A, we don't need to talk to each other. We will operate in tandem, in a coordinated manner, without coordinating. And this is called convergence, the convergence theory of conspiracy. Of course, there are cells of conspiracy everywhere. Intelligence agencies are conspiratorial by definition. For example, they deal with conspiracies on a daily basis. They generate them, they implement them, they unfold them, they dismantle them. They collaborate with other conspiracies of other governments. All this is true. I'm not disputing any of this. But to attribute ma major trends, major trends, social, financial, intellectual, and otherwise, to some overarching conspiracy or conspiracies between elites or even inside elites, this is the result of fear of anxiety, of disorientation, of ignorance. The masses feel betrayed and they don't know how, and they don't know why, and they speculate using their own limited experience. They don't have experience, so they come up with things, they invent. It's conspiracies introduce sense and meaning to the world. Direction. There's a direction, there's an end. At least it introduces some kind of hope. Ironically, conspiracy theories are very hopeful. Because the conspiracy theory says if you only get rid of a conspiracy, everything will sort itself out. Everything will be wonderful. If you dismantle the conspiracy, everything will fall into place and you're going to be okay. That's a hopeful message. Unfortunately, it's unreal. You have to work hard to, to gain or to, to be worthy of happiness. Happiness has to be earned. Um, Conspiracies assuage your sense of guilt because you are complicit. You're an accomplice in everything that's happening. Conspiracies remove your personal responsibility. And so how are you going to act? How are you going to act if you don't feel responsible for what's happening? One of the greatest conspiracy theories ever is the conspiracy theory industry. It's a small group of people who, who truly communicate and coordinate with each other on a regular basis. And they're making fortunes off your, off your anxieties and gullibility and the pathology of the masses. That's the real conspiracy theory. We need to start to talk to each other, one person at a time. We need to tell each other stories about ourselves and about how things can be and about what's common and what we share. And we need to leverage these emerging common narratives in order to recreate communities and use these communities to offer an alternative to the visions of the elites. This is the true revolution. This is the only way to undermine what the elites are offering. The elites are offering slavery in anything but name. Consumerism is a form of slavery. We need to emancipate ourselves. It is a civil war, however bloodless. It's a civil war between dictates and stories, between a disjointed existence and narratives, between individuals and communities, between self-seeing and being seen by others.